This House do now adjourn. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Chair, Mr. Speaker, we knew that the halls of power were rigged for wealthy and corporate insiders. What the scandal over SNC-Lavalin has revealed in detail is just how far the Liberal government has gone to put the interests of the corporate elite over Canadians. The Liberal government keeps telling us how important an independent justice system is, but it all goes out the window when it's their corporate friends that's in trouble. We now know that over the course of four months, the former Attorney General faced sustained, ongoing, organized pressure from the Prime Minister and his office, the Privy Council's office, the office of the Minister of Finance, to politically interfere by granting a deferred prosecution agreement to SNC-Lavalin. This is so SNC won't have to go to court and face bribery and fraud charges. As we all know, the Attorney General cannot be pressured by the Prime Minister to intervene in decisions of the Public Prosecution Service. It is entirely inappropriate. How many times did the former Attorney General have to say no before the Prime Minister and his team listened? She repeatedly said no, yet they repeatedly ignore her and were consistent in their attempts to improperly pressure her to change her mind for the well-connected friends for the Liberals. The Prime Minister first outright denied that this even occurred. Then smear campaigns began to undermine the former Attorney General's credibility. They tried to label her as, quote, difficult to work with. One Liberal MP said it was, quote, sour grapes. Then it was simply that she interpreted the matter differently. As well, every effort was made to shut down the Justice Committee and the Ethics Committee. And then when the former President of Treasury Board resigned because she had lost the confidence of the Prime Minister over this matter, the Finance Minister suggested that she resigned because of her friendship with the former Attorney General. A Liberal MP called her, quote, pathetic and, quote, traitor. Then leaks from the Liberal machine suggested that the Prime Minister came into conflict with the former Attorney General because of a, of a judicial appointment. The individual in question responded to say, quote, I fear that someone is using my previous candidacy to the Supreme Court of Canada to further an agenda unrelated to the appointment process. The Liberal government had also tried to claim that some 9,000 jobs would be lost if SNC did not receive a deferred prosecution agreement. Then SNC-Lavalin had actually come out in a public statement to contradict that claim. And not only did the government fail to do an assessment of any potential job loss, according to the criminal code, the Public Prosecution Service is prevented from considering the national economic interest as a reason for issuing a deferred prosecution agreement. This specific text was introduced to the Canadian law under this Prime Minister's watch in accordance with an OECD anti bribery convention. It seems pretty clear. The only job that the Prime Minister is worried about is his own. And what is clear is that the Prime Minister has continued to blame others and refused to take responsibility for his actions. Both senior cabinet ministers now have been kicked out of the Liberal caucus. And even after that, attempts continue to undermine the former Attorney General. Without a shred of evidence, the Liberals' machine is suggesting that the former Attorney General is trying to interfere, the new, interfere the, the, with the new AG's uh, position on this matter and is simply not credible. What we know from the former clerk of the Privy Council is that the Prime Minister is in the mood and he's going to get it done one way or another. Mr. Speaker, it is time for a public inquiry. Canadians deserve to know the whole truth. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Women and Gender Equality. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, I appreciate uh, the, uh, the Honourable Member's intervention, uh, but Mr. Speaker, I am going to focus on the question uh, that uh, the Honourable Member uh, uh, put to this House uh, according to the rules of the adjournment debate, and, and Mr. Speaker, I'm going to be speaking about uh, gender equality and uh, the place of women in this House. And Mr. Speaker, I am I'm very pleased to highlight the many ways our government is putting gender equality at the heart of its decision making because, Mr. Speaker, our government knows that when we invest in women, we grow the middle class and strengthen the economy for everyone. Mr. Speaker, since the first days of this government, our Prime Minister has showed incredible leadership and put 
equal representation at the forefront by appointing the first gender balanced cabinet in Canada's history. Our Prime Minister knows that women must have more than just a seat at the table. Since then, we have achieved a number of firsts. Mr. Speaker, the first woman government house leader sitting right in front of me. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the first woman minister of agriculture in this country, the first ever federal strategy to prevent and address gender-based violence, gender budgeting, because we know that the decisions the government makes impact different people differently, and creating the Department for Women and Gender Equality, making Status of Women Canada into a full department and ensuring its full and equal place within the government. Mr. Speaker, our commitment continues uh, through Budget 2019, 2019, which delivered uh, new measures to provide housing security for women, parental leave to address gender disparity in skills development, a strategy to combat human trafficking, and a historic increase to support for women's organizations and helping them through the Social Finance Fund. With a framework to measure results, we are ensuring that we are accountable to Canadians. Mr. Speaker, for 10 years, the Conservatives undermined, underestimated, and underfunded women's organizations. And they muzzled them so they would not be able to advocate for women's rights. Our government restored advocacy as an activity eligible for funding. And while they closed regional offices at Status of Women Canada, leaving only four offices, we are restoring our presence across the country with 16 points of service. And our government has made the single largest investment in the sustainability of women's organizations so that over 250 of them could keep their doors open and continue to save and transform lives. Mr. Speaker, last week these seats were filled by 338 young women from across the country, a clear example of what is possible when the federal government steps in and invests in creating spaces and opportunities for young women to take their rightful seats in places of power and influence. Mr. Speaker, advancing gender equality is not just the right thing to do, it is the smart thing to do. We've come a long way in four years, Mr. Speaker, but we know that there is much more work to do to achieve gender equality. Our government is committed to doing that work, and I hope the honourable member will join us in, in uh, continuing that work. And I want to thank her for uh, her advocacy, particularly in the east side of Vancouver, but her advocacy for women all across Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Vancouver East. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Last week in this House, I asked the Prime Minister this question and raised the issue of the fact that the Daughters of the Vote turned their backs on the Prime Minister, making it clear that they stand with the former Attorney General and the former President of the Treasury Board. This is right at the heels of the Liberal government, the Liberal Prime Minister, kicking out these two former senior cabinet ministers. Why? Because they dare to tell the truth. They dare to stand on the integrity and would not be bent by the government's pressure to change their, their position. Mr. Speaker, that's what we're talking about. And the real truth is, a real feminist, a real feminist would not, would not try to do what this Prime Minister has done. A real feminist would not kick strong, independent women out because they stand on the in integrity and want to ensure that the truth is understood. That they would not kick someone out because they want to uphold the law and would not allow the government to continue to act in the way and behave in the way in which they have, Mr. Speaker. That's what I ask, not for the parliamentary secretary to brag about their government, but to get at the heart of the real issue at hand. And the only way to do that is to have a public inquiry, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Women and Gender Equality. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I just want to point out to the Honourable Member that under this uh, Prime Minister's leadership, we have made historic investments for women's organizations, bringing their funding to unprecedented levels. We are ensuring that women can fully participate in the workforce with parental leave options and investing in the creation of 40,000 good, affordable childcare spaces. Uh, under this Prime Minister, we are ensuring that women receive equal pay for work of equal value, uh, that women fleeing a violent situation have a safe place to turn. Uh, we've invested over $200 million to end gender-based violence, including through the gender-based violence strategy, the first ever of its kind, Mr. Speaker. Our record is clear. 
It speaks for itself. Mr. Speaker, this government and this Prime Minister are ensuring that all Canadians, regardless of gender, have an equal and fair chance to succeed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.